Obviously, the breaking news is the Supreme Court has ruled on presidential immunity, essentially establishing, if you will, uh, presidential immunity or absolute immunity. If it's an official act, what an official act is, those are the big questions that we're going to have coming out of this. But I think all the commentators, whether you're watching Fox or CNN, whatever it is, are all uh, giving this as a big win to President Trump. Uh, Professor Anderson, I just want to get your initial thoughts on this opinion. Well, I think it's important to note that this particular opinion does not necessarily establish presidential immunity. That is established by the Constitution pursuant to the separation of powers. So it's embedded within our constitutional structure that the president needs uh, immunity in order to function properly. Otherwise, he or she would be hamstrung with respect to engaging in conduct that might indeed be seen questionable after the fact. That's number one. Number two, uh, the happiest two individuals uh, with respect to this opinion are uh, Barack Obama and Joe Biden, because essentially their conduct, particularly official conduct, is now subject to immunity. And the Supreme Court has made that very, very clear. Thirdly, I would argue that Justice Roberts was very intent on establishing this principle for all all future presidents, not simply President Trump. So I think this is a win for the Constitution, it's a win for the American people, and it's a win for democracy. Professor Hutchison, there's uh, something that comes out of one of the concurring opinions. This is from Justice Thomas, and it relates to something we talked about on this broadcast just a couple weeks ago, where Judge Cannon in Florida held a hearing, and a lot of commentators called it unprecedented that she would have this hearing, not just on the documents, but actually had oral argument in her courtroom about whether or not Jack Smith is has the authority or was properly or lawfully appointed as special counsel and we predicted then that could be an issue that could find its way up to the supreme court if she were to say i don't think he has been appointed properly that's going to be appealed and then it would naturally make its way up to the supreme court on an issue like that we're seeing a little bit of telegraphing from justice thomas where he sits on this issue and he writes in his concurrence in this case, the attorney general purported to appoint a private citizen a special counsel to prosecute a former president on behalf of the United States. But I'm not sure that any office for the special counsel has, quote, been established by law as the Constitution requires. By requiring that Congress create federal offices, quote, by law, the Constitution imposes an important check against the president. He cannot create offices at his pleasure. If there's no law establishing that office that the special counsel occupies, then he cannot proceed with this prosecution. And he even goes on to say, if this unprecedented prosecution is to proceed, it must be conducted by someone duly authorized to do so by the American people. So we we see a Supreme Court justice taking on an issue that's a very live issue in a court in Florida right now. Judge Cannon has not ruled on that yet. But what's your take on what uh, Justice Thomas decided to reveal here about his thoughts on the office of the special counsel? Well, several uh, takes. Number one, Justice Thomas is telegraphing an issue uh, before uh, uh, Judge Cannon's uh, court. That's number one. Number two, I think uh, Justice Thomas is correct. More likely than not, Jack Smith was not duly appointed consistent with the United States Constitution. If Justice Thomas is correct, then all of the cases brought by Jack Smith should fall apart, and you would then need to appoint a, a different individual who would, I think, have to go before a grand jury and to bring these cases in the future. So this means at the end of the day, I think, uh, at least from Justice Thomas' perspective, that all of these cases— fall away. And as uh, Jay pointed out correctly, I think, 
the Georgia case goes away, uh, the Jack Smith case in Florida goes away, and the election interference case goes away. And so I think at the end of the day, what have we seen? We have seen a waste of millions upon millions of dollars uh, in the prosecution of a former president. And there is no legal or constitutional basis for these prosecutions. Do you think they go away regardless if President Trump wins re-election? I, I think, think that is. That I think that think is. Could be over I think that a lot is of people are correct. obviously saying if he wins, these are, a lot of these are dead. But I, even I, if, even uh, so, whether he wins yeah. or loses, these cases should go away, and it provides basically an object lesson for any future president. Yeah. If you are going to appoint a special counsel. Make sure that special counsel was duly appointed. Yep. Otherwise, it is a waste of time. And typically, as we have seen with Jack Smith, virtually everything he does is a waste of time. All right, let's quickly take a call. Let's go to Roger, who's calling in Oregon on line three. Roger, you're on the air. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I have more of a comment uh, than question. I'm not surprised by the Supreme Court decision. I actually expected it. Uh, what I find encouraging and comforted by is that on one side we've got judges grounded in the Constitution and whose decisions are framed by the Constitution. However, on the other side, there are judges who view the Constitution as a fluid document like Hillary Clinton envisioned in her debate with President Trump in 2016. And this is even made worse by a new liberal judge who can't even define what a woman is, which to me is very scary. Yeah, I think there's a lot of reaction coming out. There's actually, I saw one of the Chirons on Vox, we have all the news stations up here, and it said, you know, that Jeffries calls the Supreme Court extremist, you know, right-wing extremist is what's happening. But of course, that's only on the cases where they disagree with them. Right. Because we've had now cases, many in the last few weeks, where you've said this is a very, you know, balanced court. Well, and even to that point, uh, the caller was referencing Justice Jackson at the end of that comment, but she actually sided with the conservatives on the Fisher case, and that's where the the statute of the obstruction of official proceeding was over-broadly interpreted and actually could infringe on many First Amendment activities the way that the court was taking it. And so, therefore, even sometimes the justices you don't expect to side with you side with the Constitution. Maybe some of them are actually doing their job, and I think that's okay. If you actually have a Supreme Court where it's respected that they will call things the way they feel and the way they see it and also what they think is constitutional. And I think maybe what we're seeing is though they get mad about these cases, really, if you break it down, I'm going to encourage you, uh, caller, to not fall into that trap because there are sometimes, I mean, sure, they're going to fall a little bit more conservative, a little more liberal, but we are seeing now time and time again, as it's been the Supreme Court, no only got a minute here, that sometimes it can be pretty even-handed. I think that's precisely correct. And if you look at the Fisher case, it's important to keep in mind that that case was predicated on an Enron accounting scandal statute. It was designed to prevent future Enrons. It was not designed to deal with so-called interference with official proceedings uh, in Congress. We are kicking off the Life and Liberty Drive today. Be a part of it. Become an ACLJ champion also if you can. That is someone at any level that decides to give on a recurring automatic basis. You can do that right now. And during Life and Liberty, all donations are matched and doubled.